this is the 11th video in the B3 revision tutorial series. In this video we will look over enzymes as well as how they are used in industry. We will also look at restriction enzymes. In this video we will look at the use of enzyme technology including chymosin and invertase. We will look at how we can use immobilised lactase to produce lactose free milk. And then finally we will look at recombinant DNA technology using insulin as an example. You will have come across enzymes before during B2. However, as a little bit of a reminder, an enzyme will bind to a substrate to form an enzyme substrate complex and then will carry out a reaction. These reactions can either be catabolic or synthetic. This means that they're built up. So we have two substrates coming into the active site and the enzyme will join them together. We can see the lock and key system that you'll have looked at previously. Our second form is anabolic or metabolic, which is the breaking down. This is the one you'll be more familiar with. So here we have the enzyme binding to a substrate and the enzyme will cut it in half to make two new compounds. It's important to remember that the enzyme can be used over and over again. However, over time it will gradually wear out as it is a biological molecule. For B3, you need to know about how enzymes are used in industry or how they're used to make different products. The five you need to know about are how they're used in washing powders, how they're used to make cheese for vegetarians, as well as in sweets. We also need to know about how enzymes are used in order to make fruit juice, and finally, how they can be used to make lactose-free milk. The first industrial use that we need to know about is how enzymes can be used in washing powders. So some washing powders carry the bio name that we can see here. So there are both biological and non-biological washing powders. Biological washing powders contain enzymes that help digest fats and proteins in food stains. The enzymes break down these large molecules into smaller molecules that are then water soluble. This means that the smaller products will then wash out with the water, whereas those larger stains will not. In non-bio washing powders, these will contain different chemicals, for example, detergents that will break up these stains in a similar way to how enzymes work. Biological washing powders work best at 40 degrees or lower and also at a neutral pH. This is because they contain enzymes and temperatures higher than this or pHs that are either too acidic or too alkali will cause the enzymes to denature. This means that biological washing powders do not work in areas that contain very hard water because it will be too alkaline. We looked over hard and soft water in C3.2. Biological washing powders contain a variety of enzymes to break down different stains. So we have amylases and carbohydrases that will break down carbohydrate stains such as jam and chocolate into simple sugars. So amylase breaks down the starch that is found in them into things like glucose. Next we have lipases that will break down lipids or fats such as butter and oil into fatty acids and glycerol. And finally proteases that will break down the proteins found in blood and grease into amino acids. All of these products are then water soluble so they can be removed from the cloves. Some products advertise themselves as special stain removers, for example, a specialised blood stain remover. These will often contain proteases in order to break the blood down into amino acids. We can also use enzymes in food production. One example of this is the manufacturing of vegetarian cheese. So rennet is a substance that is produced by a calf's stomach to clot milk so it can be digested for longer. Rennet contains an enzyme called chymosin and this is used in the production of cheese as it will cause the milk to clot and turn into our cheese.
We can also make chymosin artificially by genetically modifying microorganisms and then using them in the manufacturing process. So growing them up in a fermenter in order to produce our chymosin. This then makes vegetarian cheese as we have not got the rennet from the calf's stomach. The microorganism that is usually used for this is yeast, as it is easy to grow up in a fermenter. To look over fermentation in more detail, look at the previous video, B3.10. Our third use of enzymes is in the production of sweets. This is where invertase, also known as sucrase, is produced by a type of yeast, which is known as Saccharomyces cerevisiae and it is used to produce our sweets. Invertase or sucrase converts sucrose to glucose and fructose. Both glucose and fructose are much sweeter than sucrose is, so you don't need as much sugar in order to make the sweets taste nice. This means it is much more cost effective as we're not having to use as many ingredients. Also, because we're not having to use as much sucrose in order to get the sweetness that we require, this also means that these sweets are much lower calorie than sweets purely made from sucrose. Our fourth industrial use of enzymes is in the production of fruit juice. This uses the enzyme pectinase, which is extracted from fungi. Pectinase breaks down pectin, which is a molecule found in plant cell walls. It is used industrially to increase the yield when extracting fruit juice. So you put in your fruit into your mixture and the enzyme will break down the cell walls, allowing more juice to escape from inside the cells. You can carry out a simple experiment of this, where you cut up an apple into small chunks, put some into a beaker containing pectinase and some just containing water. Incubating them for about 40 degrees C for 15 minutes in order to make sure the enzymes are most active, you will then filter the contents of both beakers and find that you'll get more juice from the beaker that contained the pectinase as it has broken down these cell walls and allowed more juice to escape. The fifth industrial process we need to know for the use of enzymes is involved in the production of lactose-free milk. In order to do this, we use an enzyme called lactase. Lactase breaks down the sugar found in milk, which is lactose, into glucose and galactose. Before we look at the process in a bit more detail, we're going to look at lactase first. So as I previously mentioned, lactase will break down lactose into glucose and galactose. Both of these sugars are very easily absorbed into the body. If the body doesn't break down lactose, then the lactose will continue through the system until it reaches the gut. At this point, the gut bacteria will feed on the lactose, when this can cause stomach pain, wind and diarrhoea. Some adults don't produce lactase and therefore are known as lactose intolerant. This is because they cannot break down this lactose successfully. So how can we use lactase in order to produce our lactose-free milk? In order to create our lactose-free milk, we need to carry out a process known as an immobilisation. This is where we prevent the enzyme from ending up in the finished product. So when enzymes are used to speed up reactions, they usually end up dissolved in the mixture. This means that they can be difficult to remove, which can be problematic for use in industry. First of all, that we'll be shipping the product with the enzyme in. And secondly, we can't continue to reuse the enzyme in order to produce more desired product. As such, we need to immobilise them to prevent them from ending up in the solution. In order to do this, we attach the enzyme to an insoluble material, or they can be put inside different beads. So we can see we've got the production of the beads here. In order to make our beads, we will mix the enzyme with our sodium alginate and then add it to our calcium chloride. When the alginate enzyme mixture reaches the calcium chloride, it will solidify and form these beads. We then put our beads into a column and then this enables us to pass our liquid through them, for example our milk containing our lactose. By doing it this way, the insoluble material with the attached enzymes can be washed and reused numerous times. 
we use this immobilization method in the production of lactose-free milk. For GCSE, you do need to be able to describe this immobilization experiment. This experiment can be split into three sections. Our first section is the production of the immobilized lactase. As we looked at on the previous slide, this involves mixing our enzyme with our sodium alginate. We then add the mixture one drop at a time to the beaker of calcium chloride. As these droplets of the enzyme alginate mixture hit the surface of the calcium chloride, they will be solidified into small little beads. The lactase is immobilized inside the beads. We then allow them to harden for a few minutes and then separate the calcium chloride solution from the beads using either filtration or a tea strainer. Secondly, we need to set up our column. So we can see our column here. In order to set up our column, we put a small piece of nylon gauze in the syringe and attach a tap to the end. So we'll tap this off and we've got our gauze here to prevent the beads from running through. We then put our beads into our column. We are now ready to make our lactose-free milk. In order to make our lactose-free milk, we add our milk containing lactose into the top of our column. As this has been tapped off, we can now leave this in the container for 10 to 15 minutes. In this time, the lactose in the milk can go into the beads where it will be broken down by the lactase into glucose and galactase. Importantly, the lactase cannot leave the beads, however, the glucose and the galactose can. We then take a glucose testing strip and test our initial milk sample. What we should find is that the milk does not contain any glucose, as no lactose has been converted. Milk that hasn't been treated will only contain the lactose, so will not contain the glucose. We then collect our new milk sample by undoing our tap and collecting our new lactose-free milk in a beaker. We then test that with a glucose testing strip and compare it to the untreated milk. What we should find is that in the treated milk we get a colour change in the glucose testing strip as the lactose has been converted to glucose and galactose so we now have the presence of glucose in our milk sample. By testing for the presence of glucose, we can see if our immobilized lactase has worked and if we have glucose in our milk sample, then this means we have made lactose-free milk. Another use of enzymes in industry is to produce genetically modified organisms. You'll have looked at the production of genetically modified organisms previously in B2. You'll have come across two of the enzymes that we use. These are restriction enzymes, which we use to cut the DNA, and DNA ligase, which is used to stick pieces of DNA together. For B3, you need to know how we can use bacteria to produce human insulin. So to start with, in step one, we find the chromosome that has the human gene for insulin on it. Obviously, we can use this process for any gene, but for this example, we're going to look at insulin. We then cut it out of the gene using restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are enzymes that can cut DNA, and they recognize specific sequences within our DNA. So they'll cut it just at these points. The cut leaves one of the DNA strands with an unpaired base. This is called a sticky end, so we end up with sticky ends on both sides. This enables the gene to be inserted into another piece of DNA which has been cut with the same restriction enzyme. Next, we need to get our plasmid. A plasmid, as you may remember from B2, is a loop of DNA that exists in the bacteria. So we remove this plasmid from our bacterium. We then cut open our plasmid with the same restriction enzyme that we use to cut out the human insulin gene. This means that it will have the same sticky ends. Next, we mix together the plasmid and the human gene. We then add in another enzyme. This is DNA ligase. DNA ligase is able to stick pieces of DNA together. 
This means that it will join together the sticky ends of both the human gene and the DNA plasmid. This creates a piece of recombinant DNA, which is two different bits of DNA that have been stuck together. Finally, we then insert our recombinant DNA back into a bacterium. This modified bacterium, which is now a genetically modified organism, is then grown up inside a fermenter. So we end up with millions of bacteria that are producing insulin for people with diabetes. Each of these bacteria that contain our desired plasmid are all producing the insulin. As insulin is not needed by the bacteria, they will secrete it and then we can collect this. Bacteria that contain the gene for human insulin are known as transgenic. This means they contain a gene that's been transferred from another species. As we will look at in the next video, B3.12, this can also be done with plants. An advantage of producing insulin in this way for diabetics rather than producing it in pigs is that there is a much lower chance of rejection by the body as it is human insulin. This concludes this penultimate video in the Edexcel B3 revision tutorial series. In the final video, B3.12, we will look over genetically modified organisms, food security and biofuels.